Hey, what's going on, you guys? It's Brandon here, and I'm super excited today because I have a professional that I wanted to bring on, and he is so creative. And I was just on Facebook doing my nightly scroll, and I came across a video that caused me to stop. And anytime that happens, that means that there's been somebody who's just been super creative, and I wanted to reach out to Michael. And uh, Michael Ares is going to jump on with us and do this interview, and I'm super excited to uh, just welcome him on this show as we talk about the creative process in photography and how you can apply this uh, when you're doing your own social media stuff. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Now I have a couple questions for you, so let's get started. Of course. I took a photography class back in 2012 when I was uh, at at a community college here in California called Cerritos College. And so there I took a, um, a film class was actually black and white film and I used an old Canon FTB film camera. I didn't even know what film I even used back then, but ironically I took this photography class because I wanted to do something that I thought would be an easy A and I wasn't even, and I wasn't even into photography, but I just thought, Oh, photography, you can just take pictures and snapshots and just get an A plus. Right. And then after I created my first print in the dark room, I, I, something sparked up in me that made me realize that I wanted to do something like this for the rest of my life. And of course came the other idea or not the idea, the, the other problem, which is, okay, what jobs, you know, uh, can you work for with the photography? So I, I then went from wanting to become a photo major to being a journalism major. So I, I went, I got my bachelor's degree at Cal state long beach and I worked for the school newspaper there. And then I worked internships through that through that uh, college program, where I did four uh, four internships for different papers across the country. So I did um, my first internship was for the San Francisco Examiner, and then after that I went to the Philadelphia Inquirer, and then the Palm Beach Post in Florida, and then finally the Baltimore Sun. And I did a lot of coverage. I did sports. I did political work. I did whole bunch of stuff. And then I came back home in 2017. And as of right now, I work as a, I'm a freelancer here in California. And I still will do gigs here and there for newspapers and stuff like that. And, um, and then so I've always wanted to get a full time job doing something like that. And but then in the meantime, my I, I always thought to myself, all right, well, you know, you might as well apply the skills that you have for the ministry of your church. <laughs> and so because I, I definitely was somebody for a few years that, you know, I always felt, you know, photography wasn't important for church or something like that, you know, because we just had the building name, you know, my, my church is International Pentecostal Church in Bethlehem, California. And I, I don't know, for some reason, for years, our church just never really cared that much about social media, really, until maybe about 2016, maybe between 2016, 2017. And then by that time, that's when I decided to take it more seriously to try to drive more traffic to our church. And it it was something that I was very passionate about because, you know, I think at the time our website wasn't that great. And even then we were still kind of slow to the Instagram game. And so what I, well, what me and another photographer at our church, his name is uh, Ricky Hurtado, we decided, you know what, let's just make our church Instagram page purely a photo blog. And that's worked out great for us. And we, we I, I, I shoot literally every Sunday, every Wednesday, which is kind of tough because I'm actually part of the praise team too. <laughs> and I'm also the college um, director as well. So juggling those uh, different types of ministries is a little bit t- tough sometimes. But um, but what, I'm always trying to make sure that I'm uh, filming and photographing every Sunday, Wednesday, and I, I'm always out there when we when our small groups. Um, our church our church has a bunch of hobby groups, you know, and so I'm always out there, even though I don't want to be. There's many nights that I would rather be in bed and or just watching my Netflix shows and not want to go out to Monday night prayer. Because oh, it's just prayer. I'm like, no, you have to go out there because you need content. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go to Tuesday night pastors, not uh, Tuesday pastors Bible study. Like, all right, well, just get out there. Because honestly, I, the, the more content that I go out and get, um, I just kind of have found over the over the past, especially this year, that just content is just very valuable. 
And our church has actually grown in membership these past few months because of it, because especially with this whole COVID season, people are just dying for, for, for not just content, but just a, a reason, I guess, to keep the faith, so to speak. Absolutely. And, and so I was talking to my media director, whose name is John Yoki for our church. And uh, I was telling him that, you know, I, I really enjoy working hard for the church because it's something that I, I really want to do as much as, as, as possible to keep our church relevant. And especially in this day, in this time where people are trying to find solutions to all the problems that they've had, people are losing jobs, people are losing their faith here and left and right, you know, trying to do our best to keep the church in the forefront as much as possible. And, you know, I wish we had the level of acknowledgement, like a Hillsong church or Elevation church, you know, or maybe even your church. I don't know. But, um, but we've, we've learned a lot these past few months, especially when it, especially for California, Churches now, the current rule in California is that churches can't meet indoors. So um, now our, our church kind of found a loophole, which technically you can be outside. So we, we actually have a very big backyard. And if, if anybody checks out our Instagram page at IP Church, um, they'll see tons of our backyard church photographs. We're all super wide open space. But we found that loophole. But for the first few months, when it was just literally nothing, you can't be indoors or even outdoors at all, we had to figure out live streaming. And my, my friend called it, uh, said, said it best that we were, our church was literally being baptized by fire, you know, <laughs> where, and that, and that was probably the case for a lot of churches, you know, because I, I, when we started doing live streams, tons of, um, tons of churches would hit us up asking us advice for cameras, for a bunch of things. And I'm not an ex- I'm not the biggest expert on live stream. I'm more of a pure just photo and regular video guy. But it really it really surprised me that a lot of churches didn't have um, a live stream presence or even an Instagram and Facebook presence. And you know, our our church really took that to heart and was trying to learn as much as possible throughout these past few months how to better ourselves as a church. And so. Um, I don't want to ramble on too much. Hopefully I'm giving some good content or there's some insight, but um, these past few months have definitely been a journey, at least for me too, spiritually and, and mentally and trying to also figure out, all right, how can we use our, our skill sets and the knowledge that we've learned for the kingdom of God? And, you know, and honestly what we've been doing, which I guess we'll get to more later in this interview has been working for us. You know, we've been getting um, DMS and messages and people visiting our church saying that they have found us because of our social media presence. And that makes me very happy to hear because you spend so much time and effort. And sometimes as a church photographer, you kind of wonder to yourself if the work you're doing is even worth it, I guess you can say sometimes, Um, because you keep thinking that sometimes it's just the same people that go to your own church that sees your stuff. But then if that one person that just happened to, to just come across your page by a hashtag or whatever, and they decided to come to your church. That's the greatest feeling in the world uh, to me. And yeah, I, I love doing what I do. I love being a church photographer. And I love just applying the skill sets that I've learned and that God's blessed me to have been able to learn and use it for his glory. And honestly, it's one of the, to me, it's one of the most greatest ministries ever. Um, I, may, I make a case <laughs> sometimes, it might be a little naive, but sometimes, you know, for conferences and stuff like that, you know, there's the, there's the sound guy, there's the, the praise team, there's the guest speaker, right? Conventions for thousands of people. And I kind of joke a little bit where I say, you know, technically the photographer is technically the most important person in, in, the, con- in the convention because when you really think about it, messages come, messages come and go sometimes, you know. People will have to actually write down notes or buy the, the conference video to listen to what the preacher had to say. And then worship set lists, they come and go, Right. But if you have a set of images of that convention, people will always remember those, the memories, right? You oh, know, yeah. people might not remember how the sound was for that, for that convention week. But if you just get, you know, a good set list of whatever that convention was like, um, and then seeing grandparents or parents be like, oh, that's my son worshiping the Lord in those Facebook comments, right? Oh, yeah. that's my daughter. She just turned back to Christ and yada, yada, yada. And so, yeah, as I say, jokingly say, well, technically we're probably the most important because we document these events. And then, like I said, people might not remember messages, you know, but they always, if they have the images, they'll remember at least how they felt during that time, you know? And so, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I can turn it back to you a little bit, just trying to ask your question or uh, your personal experiences. Are, are you a photographer as well for your church? I know you're a videographer, and I've yeah, seen a little so, bit of stuff. And that's what I love that we're having this conversation because, like, uh, primarily I just do video. That's like, that's my bread and butter. That's like what we do. And it's cool to hear your story and, and how, uh, how you started out. Now I, there's a couple questions I had for you, which is like, are you a part of your church's, uh, like ministry team? Like, are you, are you getting compensated by that? Or is this your passion? This is what you've been called to do. And you, you're giving this to your church. Uh, I would love to kind of make that disparity if you, if you can touch on that. Sure. Um, it's, it's one of those things where, so no, I'm not getting paid. Um, I think there's, there's a running joke that I see a lot with most creatives so where my personal favorite joke is you're getting paid in uh, kingdom books. <laughs> and so, you know, what's funny is that I've, I've always felt, you know, okay. Like, you know, I, I guess when you've been a professional photographer for so long, cause I've been doing this since 2012 for sure. And then, um, at least starting photography and then professionally for sure since 2015. So, and, and, and I mean, I've seen a lot and I've been everywhere and of course by the grace of God. And so sometimes that little bit of the carnal side of you is like, Hey, you know what? I'm worth, you know, a, a, some money. Right. At the same time though, my, my, I remember my dad had a conversation with me once because uh, I did. I used to do conventions for for a few years for our for our church uh, district, and then I did it for three years. And then they've always been, you know, they would always say thank you for your work, you know. And then finally one year, I just asked, you know, Les, can we do a compensation this time? And then they decided to not go with me and then go with somebody else. And so um, I remember. I remember back then I was obviously a little bitter about it, right? Because <laughs> it's just like. Oh man, like I was so faithful for so many years, and and then and, and not only would I just produce work, I would pro- I would produce work and upload the photos during service because when you worked in journalism for so long, um, you're used to photographing, and then even while the event is going on, have to edit and then process caption and then send it out to your news editor, right? And so I, I was trained like that. And so just, and so people would be, would say, wait, these are photos from this service? Like, like, you know, altar call just ended, you know, it's like, oh yeah. But, um, so at first I was a little offended, right? Cause I had a workflow and everything, but then my, I remember my dad had talked with me and then of course the wife's father and he uh, was saying, you know what, you know, sometimes there are certain things that are just bigger than, than money and, you know, for compensation and stuff like that, because you don't want that bitterness to overshadow, um, your it, it, your ministry really and so there are times where i do want to bring it up to my pastor and be like yo <laughs> like you know <laughs> the quality that i can make and it is worth something and at the same time though to me i i believe firmly in submitting to the the, the will of the leadership obviously and, you know, I've had conversations with, with our media team and they were saying, you know, if we ever did have a budget, we would obviously want to pay, you know. And then, my, cause that, honestly, that would be my, my dream job is just to be a full-time media person for my church. And I, I get that churches, not all, a lot of churches can't do that, you know. If there's a lot of mega churches that can because, you know, all the ties and everything that come in, they have the budget and leeway to do that. And, you know, but for smaller churches, it's, it's very tough because a lot of that budget will go to keeping the lights on sometimes, you know, absolutely, or, or to do, or to do repairs for the, for the, for like the, the parking lot or the bathrooms or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I wish I was being paid for. And, but at the same time though, I try not to make it a thing where like, don't you know who I am? Right. It's, it's more of, okay, you know what? Because when you think about it, even missionaries, right? When you think of missionaries who do literally 20 times more than what I do, right? And then sometimes missionaries get paid in, get paid in nickels and dimes sometimes, right? Sometimes the money they make are just so they can go fly back to the country that they came from. And so when I, when I think about it that way, I think to myself, all right, you know, these people are risking their lives, you know, trudging through the mud of whatever here in India and China, whatever, you know, and I'm just here in my comfy little outfit my camera right so that kind of um when i think of it that way the whole doing it for money thing 
you know, I kind of feel better at peace about it, you know, because I have been, I have been fortunate to do something like this as opposed to other people's missions field. So you bet. And I, I guess from my own experience, sometimes when we just give, give of service, right, we, we know what we're good at. Uh, God has blessed us with these gifts and we, if we can bless the lives of other people with them, then what's interesting is sometimes we'll come in contact with someone inside the church who might be associated with a business or something, and they might reach out to you to come into their business and and work in that respect. And so the way that I've seen it work in my own life is that when I give and serve, then like usually it comes back uh, in other ways than, than necessarily, you know, from the church. And so I just thought that that was definitely cool how you touched on that. I think your heart's in the right place. And I just, for how much, uh, commitment and time you're giving to this craft. I just I I just want to make sure we touched on that because I think that there's probably a lot of people who are working for their churches right now who are probably thinking the exact same thing like man if I if this could be my full-time job um in fact even um so I own a video production company and there was a guy that I worked with. Um, he got a job uh, as a video director down in, in a church in Arizona. And it was just really cool to be like, that's his passion and drive in life is that's, he knows that that's what he wants to do is to be able to serve in that capacity. And he got into a job that actually, that his church actually pays him to do that full time. And so not to say that that's not something that might happen in the future, but what I did want to talk about and transition into is your photography. And you talked about how uh, how you guys have done this outdoor. Uh, for those that are watching this, uh, we're going to put a link down in the, in the description so you can go and check out uh, Michael's video. But it is it was really cool to see your photography and to be able to see that the outdoor kind of almost, I don't want to say it's a tent, but the way that you guys have structured the, the, the shades and it just, it looks so inviting. And just like you said, the fact that you're able to take a picture and you guys are growing your Instagram channel is super cool. And the fact that, yeah, there's people out doing missionary work and the fact that you can have an effect on souls just to come through your own photography, I think is super cool. And that's, thanks so much for jumping on today to, to talk about this because this gets me excited because I feel like we're in a similar field and this is something I'm passionate about. And so I'd love for you to, to, to talk more about that. Sure. Well, I guess first and foremost with, with, Instagram and stuff like that. What we, 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 we always, we, our, our biggest focus is Instagram for us. Facebook is second. Um, reason being is because I, we feel like the more engagement, at least for our church, the engagement is higher on our Instagram than for Facebook. Um, particularly because our Instagram is more catered to a, a photo blog. So, um, for, and, and we, and we think that works for us because the beginning of this year in January, we had about, 590 ish um, followers at that time. And then now we have a uh, 1,050 people. So just to see that huge jump from January till now, that's a huge increase, right? And so that's why we, 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 we really strive for sure just to keep it as a photo blog with some videos in between um, because we believe that good content is king, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's it's one of those things where you have to focus on just good photography because like, like as we were talking about, it's what lets people know that the church is a welcoming place, right? And not only do you see services, here's the ladies ministry, men's ministry, kids ministry, whatever. And it's one of those things that we're like, we're, we're super hardcore with not flooding our Instagram with flyers. And even our Facebook too is, is flyers. And my, one of my biggest pet peeves is when churches, all of their accounts are only just flyers you know, prayer on Tuesday, special guest revival, this, right? And, and it's, it's kind of annoying because they'll have a, a, a flyer that isn't even relevant anymore the week, a week later. It's like church picnic, right? And uh, for, for us, we have some flyers on our Instagram, but it's normally for landmark things, like our church play that we would do, or, you know, a certain th or whatever a special service was that actually was a landmark thing. But anything that says Monday night prayer tonight at 7.30, we just, we don't, we, we, we relegate that to the Instagram stories um, because we don't want our Instagram to look spammy. 
I guess you can say. And we just want it to be as clean as possible where people can just literally just scroll and just see images for days, you know? So that, that's, that's our philosophy. And, and even if we do have to post a flyer on our Instagram page, normally after that event's over, then we'll go back and delete it to kind of keep that, you know, freshness going. Um, and, to your, and to your point or your observation of the tent and stuff like that, um, that was a huge investment for us. We actually believe that God primed us up for the COVID season because li- we literally got that tent. It's a canvas um, over our church, maybe about two or three months, I believe, before this all happened. And um, I remember it, it cost about 10000 or so dollars to get. And I remember it was, it was a church initiative or church uh, vote, I think it was. And, you know, like, hey, do we want to invest this much money? And the church had a vote and stuff. And we decided, you know what, yes, we need some shade in the backyard. And then lo and behold, COVID happens. And now we have this, this, this canvas that our church invested in. And that's def- it was definitely a God thing. Because um, if you look at some of our photographs, the tent does cover a big portion of our backyard. But we decided that since, of course, we can spread out even more so, we added more chairs beyond the canvas. And so we actually purchased two or three of those canopy umbrella tents, you know, to kind of go off to the side where the canvas can reach. But, um, yeah, God definitely had his hand over our church in that aspect of it. He's like, you know what, I'm going to make sure your necks are all covered, you know, put some shade, right, because he wanted to see our church thrive during the season. That was a very big blessing because of that. Um, now with the whole, uh, POV video for, for photography for that. Um, so I, I run a YouTube channel just like yours as well. And so when my, I, I think I, this is like my third week or fourth week starting this channel and it's little, it's literally just my name, Michael Ayers. But the emphasis that I wanted for the YouTube channel was for church photography specifically. And I might actually branch out a little bit more to, to, to do a little bit of video stuff. But for the most part right now, I feel it's just really photography because that's where my biggest passion is. And I wanted the channel to be a resource for people just to, just to learn how to do photography. And I had a friend of mine ask me, why would you want to talk about church photography instead of talking about photojournalism or portrait photography or wedding photography? And I'm like, well, there's literally thousands of other channels that talk about that and they probably will do it way better than me. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not the greatest wedding photographer, fashion photographer, portrait photographer, but I, I know what my niche is really. And it's that documentary style, photojournalism style, but I just apply it to my church stuff. And so I had the idea to create POV videos. And so I, I have, I have my camera here. I, I'm, a, I'm a hardcore Nikon shooter. Like I'm a diehard Nikon guy. This is the Nikon Z6. And so it's got electronic viewfinder inside. And um, I, I shoot using, have you heard of the Atomos uh, system, the Atomos Ninja Pros? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah, so what I do is um, I have an Atomos Ninja 5 monitor. It connects to the top of here, big old gaping block. It's in my room right now, but I don't want to get it. It's too big and clunky. But, <laughs> but what's totally cool is that, but of course with the HDMI cord, I'm able to plug it through my camera. And then of course through the viewfinder cords, whatever I see through the viewfinder. So my first video is actually my first watch, is my, fir- is my most watched video so far, is the um, church photography with, my, with an 85 millimeter. And so I, I did that one and I got tons of DMs, messages from people being like, bro, this is exactly what I wanna see because a lot of people w- wanted to take pictures for their church uh, and, and then about a lot of times, a lot of them didn't know specifically either what to shoot, but more, impor- but more importantly, how to shoot it. Because you can photograph any pastor preaching, right? But how do you make it interesting where, say, if you use a person on, on the pew as a foreground and then the pastor in the middle ground and maybe the cross in the background all blurred out? Or There's just minor things that to certain professional photographers seem to be common sense, but to the average punk person, right? that are just getting into it. They're not thinking like how we think. So we've been doing it for years. And so with the POV videos, they were thinking, oh, okay, you, you bend your knees and aim up for this kind of shot. Okay, you know, lay on your belly. I'm just kidding, don't lay on your belly. I didn't do that in one video. But 
like, you know, jump off the roof and get a shot. No, just kidding. But um, just certain angles that the POV video would show um, were, were, were number one, showing people what my autofocus was doing, right? And how, how it was looking inside, like what I'm exactly locking on. Two, it was showing and in, in my viewfinder what my settings were. It was showing what my shutter speed was, what my aperture was, and what my ISO was. And, um, and then three, obviously, is showing what exactly I'm thinking for the scene. And I thought, I thought it was interesting because whenever I see photographers or when people probably see me taking a photograph from the side, right? If you, if you just see me like this, from this angle pointing at me, and you're thinking, okay, he's photographing the scene, but what specifically is he looking at? And it, it helps to give people an idea, okay, well, he was aiming at that scene, but it was specifically this one person doing this particular thing. Because people only see the general scene. They don't see the specific thing that you or I see, right? So I, so I thought to myself, you know, there's not enough church. There's really no. I mean, when, when I looked on YouTube, I just typed in church POV photography, and there was only one other guy. One other guy had only, had, had only one video, and it was just his camera, and there was a GoPro on top. So it wasn't through the viewfinder. It was just more the GoPro on top. So you would see kind of the edge of the lens of him walking around taking a photograph. But, and so I really thought how, I could, how could I do something similar but make it different and more unique. And I thought, well, I already had the Atomos Ninja 5, specifically because the Nikon Z6 uh, for video, when you use that, it actually allows me to shoot in 10-bit 4 to 2 And also it, it can allow me to shoot raw video as well. Um, but of course, for Nikon, if you want to get that raw function, you have to pay 200 bucks. So I'm not ready to do raw yet, even though I want to. But at least for a 10-bit 4 to 2, I can do that. The Atomos Ninja 5 allows me to. But then I thought to myself, well, I can record using this thing. So let's just try that. And so when I started doing that, as I said earlier, I was just getting tons of messages from people saying, dude, this is so helpful because I don't really know exactly what to do with photography. And this helped me out a lot. And so I thought, all right, well, how about then doing a, a challenge each, su each Sunday? You know, just, all right, so the first video was with the 85 millimeter. Okay, how about the 35 millimeter? And that was a, a challenge all in itself because with the 85, right, it's, you can be at a distance a little bit, right, not be all the people's faces. But the 35, oh, man, it's really wide. So I had to be about three or four feet from people to get a relatively decent bokeh, blurred out effect, right? And then I thought to myself, you know what? Hey, Michael, you're being dumb. You've been doing journalism for so many years. You know how to talk to people and be in people's spaces. Just do it. So I would just walk around and get in people's spaces, but obviously trying to be as respectable as possible. But that was a whole different challenge all on its own. How can you photograph a church service using only a super wide 35 millimeter lens? And then I started doing videos more, more along like that. So my last video was the 24 to 70. And then I, I have other lenses. I have a 70 to 200 millimeter that I still need to do. And then I still have to do a 50 millimeter 1.8. But then a guy from the Philippines reached out to me. And he goes, like, this is really cool. Can you do one for smartphones? And that was the one that started this whole idea. And so I thought to myself, at first, weeks ago, I thought to myself, okay, well, you know what? I, I, I messaged him saying, well, you know what? Uh, I already have a set list of what I want to do first after I'm done doing my lenses, then I'll do the cameras. And then a week or so goes by. He goes, oh, I understand, brother. You know, I, I, I hope, you know, you get, you get around to it someday. And uh, I, I like your channel, whatever. And so I, about a week or two goes by, and then I think to myself, you know what, if someone requests something, you probably should at least do it for the viewer, right? And so I, I decided to record the video doing – uh, a POV for my phone and so I messaged him saying that I was going to do it and he got super excited and and he, he didn't say what phone he used I'm assuming iPhone or at least a mid-level Android right so I, I so what I normally do is that I'll have the Atomos Ninja Pro right <laughs> or Ninja 5 but you can't have that attached to your phone at least not that I know of so literally what I did so actually the iPhone 11 is actually my dad's phone. I'm I'm poor, so I have the iPhone 8 Plus. And well, not really poor because you know when I I bought it when it first came out, the iPhone 8 Plus. 
Hey, let's let's be honest. I'm going to jump in real quick. iPhones can be expensive. The reason my I just upgraded, but I did the $400 option, not even the crazy one with all the lenses because I mean, it's as much as a laptop, you know, and or even a DSLR almost. But and that's what I'm excited to talk about with you is the fact that here you're uh, let, let me can I just t- stop for just just a second because I want to back up you guys Michael is super creative and if he doesn't know that I want to give him uh, these props because the thing is when I saw what you did with this iPhone video it got me to stop and I was like I've never seen this before and can we jump on this uh, this call today and have this conversation because I just thought it was very creative the way that you did that here you're taking something that's primarily used for video You've applied it to photography and you're giving people an experience. And what else is cool is I didn't even know this, but the fact that you're doing weekly challenges for yourself because uh, so much of what we do as creatives is we have to sometimes go into a space that we've already been inside of however many times, right? And you have in just like you were saying earlier, when you have like, okay, I'm going to go to prayer group. I'm going to go, you know, do the weekly meeting on here. I'm going to go to the church service. It's like, (laughs) right. Like we can easily get into ruts. And I'm sure that the people that are, that are watching this today can identify with that, which is that we, we, we tend to, you know, we're, we love habits, right? We, we get in the same grooves. And the fact is when I saw your video, it inspired me and I was like, oh my gosh. And so anyway, I, just i just wanted to kind of interject there and just like it, it's such creative thinking and that's what i love that you're doing and you're you're inspiring and the fact is like it got me thinking like oh my gosh i could be doing something like this not that i have to model exactly what you did and not that i would be doing this for my youtube channel but just like how can i show people what i do i mean And I loved your analogy, how you said off to the side, you might not be able to see what I'm getting, but then, you know, and like I said, we're going to put the video down below in the show notes because this, you have to check out his videos. These are super cool. So with that, will you talk about, you said uh, you borrowed your dad's uh, iPhone to shoot this thing. You know, it's funny because I, I I never thought about shooting raw before on an iPhone. I've heard that they can do it. And so... I was just kind of researching a little bit on it. And so when I, what happened was I was with my girlfriend and then I, I, I was just, let me just try something. So I downloaded uh, the, uh, an, app, an app called Halide. And I think now it costs eight bucks to do, but it's basically pro photography modes, manually do everything, but it shoots raw. And then, so I, I just tried it out and then uh, with my eight plus, and then I, I, I was able to work on it as a raw file, pulling fi- uh, shadows and highlights. And I was thoroughly amazed at the quality of the 8 Plus. And then that's when I thought, okay, how, if the 8 Plus is this good for raw output, how, can, how good is the 11 Pro is going to be? So I, I, you know, I, I told my dad, like, you know, dad, I'm just going to take this for a while, you know, just take his phone for a bit. I was just like, all right, let's just use screen recording. And then it ended up working out okay because I wasn't sure if there was going to be a lag or not with my actual photography with using the screen grab, but everything worked out fine. And um, I, I did a couple of raw photos. I went, what I ended up doing was, shoot, was shooting in, in Lightroom because I didn't know Lightroom had raw capabilities as well. And so the only bummer though was that with the iPhone, there's no raw for portrait mode and no raw for ultra wide. Mm-hmm. And so that was what I was really bummed about because I'm only a raw, I don't, raw photographer. I don't like shooting JPEGs. And it was kind of evident when you look at some of the images, um, when you push some processing and stuff like that, that some, you're really stretching certain skin tones, certain things on a JPEG image. Because we all know when you're shooting raw, you get all that data. But for JPEG, not so much. And so, um, so I really had to make sure that the exposure for the exposure for um, – the scene was as good as possible because you need a good base point for JPEGs. But I did a couple of raw images on, on the Lightroom app and it just blew my mind when I was editing in post. I was like, dude, the iPhone can do this? The iPhone can literally ed- pull down these highlights and bring back clouds and h- blown highlights of the rooftops and umbrellas. And it just blew my mind how good the raw was. And so I'm really interested because I, was, um, I do a lot of Apple research and I guess apparently the iPhone 13 is going to include more optical lenses. 
a more a, a better optical zoom lane or range. Because you know how when you digitally zoom in, it gets pixelated, right? Mm-hmm. So they're so they're saying that the iPhone 12 won't have that, but the 13 will. So I was thinking to myself, all right, well, if the 13 gets optical lenses, that that changes a, a game entirely all in itself. Because now you can actually zoom in at two at f2 on your iPhone, and it still is relatively close to a DSLR, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm excited for the future of iPhone uh, iPhoneography. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. But um, but the biggest challenge for shooting the iPhone videos, right, or iPhone photography on portrait mode, is that you have to be be within about what three to five six feet from your subject, right? Mm-hmm. And so obviously, I was fine with doing that with my cameras because people go, "Oh, he's got a camera. This makes sense. He's taking a photograph." But when you're walking up to somebody in their space like this, right? it kind of looks a little bit more creepier <laughs> because I'm you know, just like, what is he putting me on social media right now? What's happening? Am I being live streamed about something? And so, but it, the, but the portrait mode really surprised me with how good it was. Uh, well, number one in daylight, right? To, to me, the real challenge really is how good is portrait mode indoors because you know, the, the lights get are a whole lot darker, right? You have to freeze motion a different way um, indoors, but out in the open, though, it was doing really well. The only drawback that I found with shooting in portrait mode was that you couldn't rapidly take photos. Because when you, when you take a portrait photo, it kind of processes it a little bit and kind of applies that, that blurred out background. You know what I'm talking about? So you can't shoot 10 images at one really fast. It has to, you have to really anticipate your shots and that was even more challenging doesn't it and again maybe we're not uh just so that those that might be listening are thinking the same thing so port like if you're in normal photography mode it, there is a burst mode but maybe not in the portrait is, is what you're saying so that yeah. that definitely helped clarify because even on your video that you had i was like well he might not know that you can do that you know and but again i'm i'm very limited on my photography skills as far as uh the iphone goes but it is cool that they have these different portrait options that will uh, take the picture, but also kind of add that, that depth of field uh, to your camera shots. And, and you have to be, you have to be careful with it because um, I, iPhone portrait mode is, is not perfect where sometimes if you photograph somebody on portrait mode, sometimes there might be some fringing or some, mm-hmm. some, a little blur or like little softness on the edge of shoulders or sometimes even hair because it has to process a blurred out effect. Right. And so with iPhone images, you just got to be careful. But what's cool about iPhones, especially with the 11, um, is that you can actually manually adjust the bokeh effect post. So all you do, all you do is go through your iPhone and click edit. And then on the top, uh, I think the left of the screen, I think it is, it shows the aperture, 1.8, whatever. And you can just adjust accordingly and try to get it to a point where that softness on the shoulders or hair um, kind of disappears to a point where it actually looks more real. And so, and it works because I, I was showing people the photographs and they legitimately thought that it was with my camera. Mm-hmm. And so it's, and, and honestly, I'm not saying that these are the best photos in the world because I, cause I had a friend of mine asking me, he's like, oh, so how, how do you like your photographs? And I go, well, I go, well, considering what it was, <laughs> I'm happy, right? Totally. If, it, if it was my DSLR, if, if it was my, my camera, because honestly, as creatives, we should know the difference between a DSLR and actual um, uh, iPhone photograph because you can you, you can just kind of tell a little bit of skin tones and obviously how good the bokeh actually is to kind of get an idea if it was actually a DSLR or not. Although it's really close. Yeah. Um, but well, I yeah. think. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to say, I think what's really fascinating though is the fact that if you do understand how to use this tool your iPhone, the fact that it's in your pocket, you can be out anywhere at church. And all of a sudden, if you feel this, oh, I I should try to grab this. It's nice to still know how to use our tools that we have at our resources. And even if it's not maybe to your standards, how you would maybe use on your other DSLR, it's still it's still a very powerful tool. And really what I also wanted to have you on is to, to kind of almost demonstrate too that You know, some people think that they have to have this, the huge expensive stuff. And although the iPhone, you can make the argument, the iPhone does cost money, but the fact of what everything that the iPhone is and does, it's a powerful tool. And the fact that you can, like you said, I think one of the things I was most impressed with with the video is you weren't cutting 
you weren't cutting the video. So what I liked is you went up to this. There was one. There was one woman, and it looked like she was kind of looking towards you. And I don't know if you you had put your phone down, you know. And then she went back, and then you you brought it back up again to to grab that photo. But I I guess what I liked is that I'm we're we're able to experience what it's like to be you for that short duration of time. I mean, I think the video is like maybe two minutes of you actually kind of shooting. Uh, I didn't actually get the time code of, of exactly, but it, but what I liked is just the process of seeing it was kind of like, oh, no, oh, you know, that's what I probably would have done, too. OK, cool, because you're trying to get these like these candid moments of people, especially like, I don't know, like worshiping is like a personal experience. And here you are putting the camera in somebody's face, you know, and, and as much as people probably would like uh, it to kind of go out on social media to attract people in and show them what it's like. Uh, anyway, I just thought it was a cool cool experience of watching that. You're, you're a thousand percent correct on the idea that people would probably might prefer not having a, a, a camera all shoved in their face, right? But it's funny, out of, I've been doing this for a couple of years now and for the church, and out of all those years, I've only had three people tell me not to take photographs of them. Mm -hmm. um, one, one's a mom with two boys um, who's going through a divorce and like, she just wanted to just, you know, just, she just wanted nothing of her on social media just to keep her family safe, stuff like that. And I was like, cool, understandable. Another lady simply just didn't want to photograph because she just thinks like she just looks big in photographs, you know? And to me, I'm like, why do you think this way? You're so pretty. Why in the world? So like, no, 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 I just don't, I just don't like it. I'm like, right, that's fine. And then a third person is just a guy. He's just like, no, yeah, I just don't like pictures on social media of me. And I was like, that's cool. But, but, I, but I thought to myself, you know, out of a church of about close to 500 people, three is actually not that bad. You know, if it was like half the church, you know, or even, or even worse, the pastor, like, hey, Michael, you got to cool it, man. You know, that, I think that's a pretty good ratio to assume that what I'm doing is pretty, you know, socially acceptable, and, and at least in the terms of my church. Because I've had people ask me, they go, oh, yeah, it seems like it would probably be a little invasive, right? And then, but to me, I'm like, well, you know what? I don't really, I, I, I usually photograph people when their eyes are closed anyway in, in, in the congregation. So when someone's eyes are closed and you can kind of gauge if they're like in the moment, you can go up to them and kind of have a, you, you really have a, a few seconds, really, as you have seen a little bit in the POV videos, to really get in and within three seconds or less, just like, all right, compose, eyes are closed, wait for the hand moments to do this, this, hands like this, whatever, and then just get out of there before they open up their eyes again. <laughs> and, then, and then you just surprise them later on social media, what, that was a photo of you? But, so, I, so I am cautious about that. I, 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 I do make sure that, you know, if their eyes are open, it's them reading the Bible or just hands outstretched, but off to the side as much as possible. Um, hand raised or maybe pointing at the preacher, like, yeah, good word, something like that. But if someone's really, really praying and really being really deep, yeah, I usually try to gauge, make sure their eyes are closed and make sure they really are in that moment where they most likely aren't going to be open up, their, open up their eyes, right? Because yeah. it is kind of awkward when they open up their eyes and you're just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, just keep praying. It's gonna go over here for a second. You know, there there is that aspect of it. But yeah, I, I tell people all the time, and, and I and I learned this not only in journalism but also when I would do conventions for churches. I was like, if you if you act like you belong there, people would treat you like like you belong there. Mm. So a lot of times during conventions, I would literally one time I had a thirty five millimeter camera, and <laughs> I walked up. Luckily, it was altar call basically and so i just walked up close to the pulpit and just got like a nice side angle of the preacher but i was on the platform with him on this in this convention with about 15 1600 people i'm just there like yeah you know do my thing and then i kind of bounce out a little bit and then and and that was basically where i got that philosophy from because nobody nobody talked to me about it nobody was was saying oh michael you can't you can't walk on the platform get a photo of him at that close of a range because I worked the entire event as if I was the official person for this convention. And because, and if you have this, and then when you, when you think of it that way, it does give you a, 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 some confidence enough to just have no problem walking on the platform and taking a photograph because you belong there. And the more you do it, 
it just becomes common knowledge. Okay, he's the guy for that. Leave him alone. Don't give him grief for it. He's he's working hard, you know. And especially when they see the results, they're even more likely to let you keep doing what you're doing, you know, because like, oh, this is good, right? Just keep doing this. It's better than the iPhone. Of course, this was years ago. I don't know how the iPhone <laughs> argument is today, but like, honestly, confidence is, is a huge deal, and that's why I like the POV videos as well. Because there are some times where I do, where I am kind of, okay, you know, kind of looking down, but I like to kind of keep it flowing through the scene. And, and some scenes are cut shorter because sometimes I'll do a scene. There was one shot, I think in my original 85 millimeter video, where I was literally on the pastor's wife waiting for, she was singing, and I was waiting for her to lift up her left hand so I can get a nice basic shot of her holding a microphone. And she just didn't do it. She just had her hands lower below her waist, and for a good minute and a half, it was just her not lifting her head at all for a, for a portion of the song. And I, I, I had a full like minute and a half recording of it. And so obviously, I'll, I'll have to chop down those instances because nobody wants to wait a minute and a half, right? But sometimes, if you watch the full uncut portions of how long I wait sometimes for, for a certain person, it'll surprise you. But... I do like, as you said, that continuity of just keep it flowing because people need to learn that sometimes you don't get shots in milliseconds. You, get, you, you have to literally stand there and, and just kind of wait out a scene for a while. When, when I first got into journalism, prior to that, I used to do street photography. So I would literally walk, I, w- I would visit downtown LA three times a week. And I, I live in Whittier, so that's about 25, half hour drive for me. So I used to go and, and then I, I would drive there or take the metro train over there. And so, and a lot of times I would just stand on street corners and just, I would see a, I would see a scene, I would see a certain lighting situation. And then I would, I would, I would already have a picture of what I would want in my mind. And then I would just sit there and just wait for the right person to kind of come in to my scene doing something. Right. And there was some shots th- that, took me about an hour, maybe 40 minutes of just sitting on a street corner and just waiting until finally I got the shot. But it, it takes really a lot of patience and discipline, right, to do something like that because you know what you want and you just kind of have to have faith that something's going to happen. I'm not crazy while I wait two hours, right? But I kind of, if I, if I really believe long enough or if I, if I believe enough in the, of the scene, I'll stick around. And I applied that exact same mentality to church photography where – you know, there's always sometimes at least once or twice in your congregation, you're like, okay, I want to get this certain person, right? And then they're not doing exactly what you needed, right? Their hand might be like this, but you wanted them kind of more like this. And if you wait an extra 30 seconds, you most likely will probably get that shot, you know? But of course, it's up to you to realize, all right, well, I only have three worship songs, you know, left. You're right. I can't be here forever. Or I'm going to miss the rest of the uh, set list, right? Yeah. But, but on but people, I think we're in a generation now where people just want the results immediately, right? Mm. But reality is not like that, right? You have to literally sometimes stand your ground, work out the scene, feel out how it's going to go. And then if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But the good thing about church photography is that there's always next service. And that's why, <laughs> and that's why I always tell people, I'm like, if, if you don't get the shot of the pastor – oh, what, what are you going to do? There's only the rest of the year that he's going to preach again on Sundays and Wednesdays, right? See, so don't forget about that. Oh, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get a certain musician, right? Well, they're going to play again on Wednesday or Thursday, whatever, right? Like there's, there's always multiple opportunities yeah. to get certain things, right? So that's so honestly, I don't even stress out anymore. If I get two images from a service instead of 15 or 20, I'm like, yeah, that's fine. You know, there's always next next service, and that whole that and that, and that mentality of thought puts less stress on me too, mm. and makes my workflow and and photography process go by a little bit easier as well. And then, of course, um, going back to the challenges, right? Um, I was also thinking, all right, well, the challenges number one, we're all outside now, you know, but then you can kind of keep being creative by all right, well, I can do all these challenges again when I'm back indoors because that's an entirely different vibe and scenario. But then also I was thinking about doing POVs of my other events that we do. Like I said, the Monday night, 
the Monday night prayers, the whatever, you know, because it doesn't just stop at the church because the church is supposed to extend out. And so if you can just document a church prayer walk on the streets or, you know, um, a beach baptism or whatever, people still need to see how they cover all these other events besides church because church is very specific where it's mostly singers, people raising their hands and then a preacher. And that's pretty much it. Right. Whereas you have a baptism, right. There's people getting ready, right. You know, you have people, you know, putting on their baptism shirts or you have people getting their, what would Jesus do? Bracelets on. Like there's different details you can get. They're drastically different than how, what's happening at church. Cause you're at a beach this time or you're at a park this time. And I, 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 t- I take, I take prayer meetings, photos with equal importance as a Sunday service, because especially with our church, since we started doing small groups, uh, hobby groups, right. Our church has a chess club. We have fishing group. We have uh, cycling. We have uh, airsoft and paintball. We have um, single moms group. You know, there, there's literally a group for everything. Um, and to show people who are seeing your church for the first time, like, oh, well, they have chess club. Cool. I, I can nerd out for three hours and, you know, do all this kind of thing. So that's why I treat everything literally as, as serious as a worship session, mm-hmm. because a photograph of someone fishing from our church has the, an equal amount of ministry of, or meaningful impact. Because what if someone's coming to our church and they have that same interest? Mm-hmm. And they're like, what, the men go out fishing, you know, like once a month, like, oh, what the heck, I get to, you know, and yeah. I get free, and I get, you know, free 10, 15 friends by automatically by my one time visiting, right? Yeah. And it, it, it really spoke to me a little bit that a lot of times people who visit our church, um, either they, they might not have friends, or maybe they have a very small group of friends, and they want to branch out and try to do something new. And, and it really spoke to me, like, for instance, um, this past Sunday we had a revival service and so we were having service and beyond our fence was a guy just watching our service from the street mm-hmm. and he had a you know his, his like a like a hoodie ish kind of mask halfway he had a hat on he looks kind of dirty a little bit he, like his, his clothes didn't seem like they were like clean I wouldn't say he was homeless but you know it was something along the lines of like that and he was just watching he was just watching the service he, allowed, he stayed around the entire time during worship and the preaching. And then at the end, um, one of the ushers went to go seek him out. They, they walked out of the church, walked all the way around to the backside of the church. Because where, where, where the fences of our backyard, that is where the, the dumpsters are. Because next to us are all the other businesses, pizza, a pizza place, a donut shop, um, a, a, a dry cleaners, and an ice cream place. And so, you know, all the people that work there, they come behind and just dump out their trash for their, from their job and then go back. So that in between, right, is where people dump out the trash and then our church fence backyard. So the guy, I don't want to assume he was homeless, but he didn't look like he worked in those buildings, was just walking through. And he just watched, he just sees our church service and he just sticks around. And then he already got a grasp of what our church was like based off what he saw. But then now when you throw in all the images on top of that, because now, because now we have, I guess, a resume, as you can probably say, because we can pull up our Instagram and be like, oh yeah, bro, you, you like this? Like we have all this look, 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 look. And he goes, all right, well, I saw this service. I stuck around for the entire thing, which says something. And now I know that people are doing this. I want to be a part of that. And so that's why, as I was saying earlier with my joke of technically photography is probably the most important ministry because it's, it's this level of witnessing that, you know, that I take very seriously because people want to feel a part of something and photography allows them to have the opportunity to be a part of something. And then with the POV videos, it's kind of the twofold ministry too, because I'm helping photographers know what to photograph and if somebody else sees, you know, the footage of the church, because I, I, I have my friend follow me around with B-roll footage, just to kind of not only just get me, but kind of show what's happening during the service. And that kind of helps too show people, oh, like this church is still having church. Oh yeah, I'll go check them out, right? So that's kind of the inspiration of the YouTube channel is just number one, let's just 
teach people how to be creative, especially using an iPhone, <laughs> you know, and, um, and also use it as a witnessing tool because to show that church is fun, church is not a chore. And that was the big thing for me too, is that photographers, sound guys, videographers, even musicians, they can view what they do as a job. Mm -hmm. And then once altar call happens, they can just, all right, well, all right, I'm done. Let's just, let's go to the courtyard. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I try to adopt a principle where your, your job's not done once altar call hits, right? I'll, I'll take a couple photographs, right? Altar call. But then what I usually do, or at least try to do, is to pray at the altar. Um, well, now we don't have an altar because we're outside in the backyard. Um, but usually, right, I'll go to the altar and pray because the whole idea is to not make it my job to where that's the only reason why I come to church. You're obviously there to worship the Lord, and obviously you're using your talents to further the kingdom of God, you know. But just be careful that it's not you're not just there for the photography and then you leave. Like it, you're part of the worship experience, and it's very important for the media team, the sound guys, and the musicians to n to not. All right, I did my thing. I did I did my form of worship. I'm good. You still have to pray. You still have to. Make sure that your heart is right. Because you know what's, what, what's interesting enough for me, and I don't know if you've experienced this as well, is that when you photograph a scene, a lot of times I'll tune out what's being said mm -hmm. because I'm so focused on getting this shot. My mind is thinking, okay, what's the idea? So, okay, okay, is this hand raising? Is, you know, whatever, you know. Oh, spit, spit flew from his mouth. Make sure you photograph it. Ah, you know, right? And so sometimes you can get so caught up in what you're photographing that you kind of miss certain chunks of what the preaching is. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I put a special emphasis on praying at the end to kind of make up for it a little bit, you know? Absolutely. Sometimes we take, sometimes we'll take, uh, we take on the stress and burden so that we can create an experience for others to have a really good, uh, worship experience. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's just something I take very seriously. And, um, yeah, so, so far the channel on YouTube only has 68 followers, but you know, but honestly, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it where I get 90,000 followers, whatever. The whole point really is that I, I feel that most channels get started because somebody thought, okay, well, somebody has the same questions that I had, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're going to look for it. And so that's pretty much what I was thinking is that someone's going to have a question or just need inspiration of some kind to, 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 for, to try to um, take pictures for their own church. And so that's my goal really is to hopefully, you know, inspire someone to pick up a camera or an iPhone and um, just do what they can to make their church relevant in these times. And so, but yeah, so that's my story really, but. That's, hey, that's awesome. And thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's really cool. And can we talk um, a little bit about the editing process of your uh, photography that you're doing, whether it was on the iPhone? Were you, like you said that you had like the Lightroom app on your iPhone. So I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So you're able to shoot photography with your iPhone. Are you also able to then edit on the phone itself, or are you um, offloading that onto a computer and then doing the post like the post process? Like, what does that what does that look like for you? So I have, um, so I have, so right now I'm on Lightroom CC, and so um, so right now if I were to just really quick, I'm, I can just um, I know it's blown on your screen, but I'm just gonna it looks fine on my screen, so I'm just gonna click a photograph really fast, and um, I don't know if you can see. But right here, yeah, it's a little highlighted, but it'll show something called DNG. And DNG is another form of raw um, format. And so I just took the photograph. And so uh, it's in my, it's in my uh, album now. And so I have a bunch of other photos, but on the very top is here. And it's in the Lightroom app. I just photographed in the raw. It's, it's automatically in my Lightroom app. And then literally, um, what I could do is do a preset if I wanted to. I have a, I, I use something called um, Brixton Film Earthy Moods. It's a, it's a preset packet by Luke's, Luke's Lens, L-U-X-E. Um, I, I only use presets 
that I purchased for outside stuff. Um, for indoors, I do everything from scratch because for me personally, I don't believe really there's like that one preset solution because with church, we have purple lights, teal lights, orange lights, red lights. There's never a preset that fits all these different ranges. So that's why I work from scratch and just depending on what the lighting is inside, I'll adjust and do different corrections. But outdoor, you know, we're on, we're, we're on a tent and the, the time is, and the sun is always the same, <laughs> you know, every Sunday morning. So I usually have a preset that I like for that. Um, but when I work in journalism, though, I only do basic color corrections. I don't do fancy filters because in journalism, you're supposed to keep everything as real as possible. But for the church, you don't have to do that. Um, so if I so what I normally do is just um, I'll click on a preset, I'll select it, and then what I normally do, at least for the phone, I'll click uh, auto, just to kind of get an idea of what the camera thinks mm. my base point is, and then I just adjust accordingly. You know, right here, um, I have my highlight, my exposure, I have um, sorry, my highlights and shadows. But if if you look here, it's changing, and you know, it's changing. But it's a raw file. And yeah. so it's the exact same as a DSLR mirrorless camera. And I literally, what's cool too is that you can hold it down. And it shows before and after. See oh, how it's cool. a little bit? That's, yeah. what the Lightroom, that's what the Lightroom app does. And, wow. and it has literally all the functions that you would use in your actual Lightroom um, on your computer. So what's cool about this is that there is Lightroom Classic and Lightroom CC. So Lightroom Classic, do you have that on your computer? Uh, I think the, I think I'm on Lightroom Four right now still. So I mean, I bought it back in the day, but it's still it's still a great, you know. Yeah, I'm sure I'm missing out on some new new functionalities, but there you go. But what's cool is that so Lightroom Classic is just whatever stuck on your computer. But then there's Lightroom CC or Lightroom Creative Cloud. And what's cool about this is that whatever you edit on your phone travels through the cloud and will will translate to your computer. So I just took this photograph on my phone, but once we're done with the Zoom call, the the photo that I took on here will be on my computer automatically with the changes wow. that I made. So what's really cool is that with phones and even with DSLRs, because DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, they have uh, internet connection now mm -hmm. or Bluetooth connection. So what I could really, if I wanted to, is photograph in RAW and then send the raw to my phone, pull it up on my Lightroom app, and then, and then edit as if I'm working at home. And it's a full raw image. So I have the flexibility, right? And so and that, that's if I'm really pressed for time. Normally I'm not. Normally I can just go home or the, uh, the church team room and can just sit there and just kind of work for like a half hour or so and process. But if I was really in a pinch and had to get an image like now right away, I could do that. Message, message my phone from the camera and just do all the Lightroom tweaks. Yeah, I mean, if I like this was a really dark scene, if I want to, I can pull up the shadows, no problem. And it just baffles me that not enough people take advantage of this as much as possible. Now, honestly, it would change your Instagram game so much, right? Because especially when you photograph outdoors and you want to bring the highlights back from the clouds and stuff, when people use just their regular phone with the jpegs to me i'm like oh, how, can, how can you be just happy with that <laughs> you know? as, a, as, a, as a video person and a photographer when you when you know what a, an image's full uh, potential could be you're just like why would you only want to use an instagram filter because instagram filters are just flat there's not you can't pull highlights and shadows on instagram filters it's just all right here's a color that's it but when you know that you can manipulate and honestly Anyone can use it. it. You don't have to be a professional photographer. If you just know the basics of all right, contrast, clarity, highlight shadows, thick netting, not too much, noise reduction, sharpness, you're pretty much good. I mean, that, that's pretty much it. And you can, you can manipulate saturation, right? Mm -hmm. If I wanted to, even Lightroom, I can click on my shirt and just pull down only the red, but still have all the other colors. You know, you can do whatever you want. And nice. so... So cool. And so... Um, it's an app, I think, I think, because everyone's used to, I think, is it called the Visco app, I think, right? Okay. And so the Visco app is another editing tool that a lot of churches use a lot, where you can, you can shoot in raw in there too, and you can use a bunch of presets that they, that they already have on the app. 
But for me personally, I feel that Lightroom is the best because you have the best control mm -hmm. for it. Um, so there's that. There's another app too that I like. It's called uh, Focus. You might have heard of it. Um, it's basically an app where um, you can't manually photograph exposure, stuff like that. But what you can do, it, it's kind of like a portrait uh, okay. app. So what you can do is, once again, you can only photograph in JPEG. But whatever you click on on the photo, on the, uh, photo um, it'll, blow, it'll blur out that part of the image. And so, I mean, I guess I can take a photograph of my camera here. I'm just kind of giving an example. And while you're doing that, I just want to jump in and say this, that uh, when you guys go and check out Michael's video, what I thought was really cool is you'll see him taking a picture of people uh, during the worship. And what's cool about it is it's like, oh, that's a cool photo. And then he'll show you how he's making the adjustments on the photo. And it's kind of the, bef the before and after. And what I thought was a great photo at the beginning, he then enhances it through what he's just talking about uh, through these uh, apps. And the fact that all of these can be accessible on the phone and the fact that we can just, uh, we have such powerful tools now. That's why they cost what they do because you can do so much stuff on them. And just like Michael was saying, in a pinch, if you get into that situation where you need to be able to do something, super cool. Plus the time saving of, okay, it's on my phone, but it now because of the cloud, it's also on my desktop computer ready for me with anything that you have already made adjustments on. Uh, anyway, this is just so cool. I love geeking out on this technology. Yeah. So here's the focus app right here. So I took, let me make it brighter if I can. Let's write it's bright. So you see how it's sharp and everything here. But what's cool is that I can click on the back here, the blurred out section, and then that becomes Whoa. the focus. And then this one is, Right, so I can choose specifically what, because it's a, it's a processed image, right? Right. From, from, from the app. So I can choose specifically where I want the focus to be back and forth, you know? I don't know if iPhones can do that. I haven't played around with it. But that's another option too. Very cool. If, if, if you wanted that portrait um, look. And what's cool too is that you can also manipulate how sharp it is. So, oh, um, nice. So now, now it's at infinity. But then okay. when, I, when I bring it back up, gets more blurred out so you can control the uh, the depth how blurred out the image can be That's and so cool. I mean th th these are tools that have been around for a while um, and then I guess the professional will be like oh yeah oh, I've known about this forever but if you're <laughs> someone that that literally has no clue and you're new those are the apps that I would look into is the Lightroom mobile app because number one you can shoot raw as well as edit on your phone and transfer it to your uh, actual Lightroom. The only the only catch is that you have to be subscribed to Lightroom's um, subscription. So I think it's like nineteen bucks a month, but it's with Lightroom and Photoshop, so you get both programs. And of course, uh, Adobe uh, Adobe Creative Cloud has more um, plans if you want to have add Premiere Pro. If you want to add a Premiere, uh, Adobe After Effects stuff, which I think, do you use that or no? Uh, primarily, we're using Final Cut, uh, everything Final Cut. Yeah, Final Cut Pro is fantastic on the video side. Uh, again, I don't do a whole lot of photography stuff, um, but like I said, I have Lightroom 4, <laughs> so if I ever do need to. Um, but yeah, in fact, I had one other question I wanted to ask you, Michael, which is talk to me about, okay, so here you're at your church on a Sunday, like if you're taking all these photos, how many photos would you say actually end up on social media? And, you know, is it, do you guys have like a backlog? Like if you could talk to me about how you guys produce the content for your Instagram channel to kind of help give other churches this idea of how many they should maybe be taking per week. And if you have a backlog that you can then uh, throughout you know, the week be dripping this stuff out. So my, my keep ratio was actually very high because what I used to do, and sometimes I still do it a little bit where I'll, on Instagram, you can only do 10 photos max for a, one post. So I would actually do service is great today, all 10 photos from that day. Um, so literally probably within the last week or so, I think now what I'm planning on doing is maybe doing one to four from that day and then just pocketing the rest because it's very tempting to post everything from that, from that day or night, whatever. 
But then at the same time, you could possibly be hurting for content throughout the rest of the week. So normally, my, my normal shoots that I do for the church range between about between 100 to maybe 200 shots, which might seem low to some people. Um, but for me, that's the sweet spot. Because for me, I come from the film background. And with film, you only had 36 shots to work with. So you had to really be sure that you anticipated each shot correctly and not waste your film, right? So that's why I felt comfortable when I was shooting in portrait mode, right? Because I couldn't fast, right? So I had to anticipate and just kind of treat it as if I was back with my film days, right? Don't waste the shot, make it count. And so that's why a lot of times, whenever I shoot weddings and stuff like that too, or even conventions, like I think one wedding I did, I had like about 400 shots because I would rather have 400 shots that I've taken <laughs> with, with 30 fantastic shots than a thousand, 2000 shots, but then maybe 10, 15 that the bride really liked. Right. And that's just my personal philosophy is I shoot with intent. And that was a big thing for me all of my life where people are like, Oh, megapixels, you can shoot on a 46 megapixel camera and you can crop all the way in and still have that great detail. And I think, well, that's great, you know, but I normally like to shoot shots where I don't really have to crop that much or at all. If I can, I want my shots to be already framed specifically how I envisioned it. Maybe like a little bit of a tilt adjustment or maybe a little bit of a bump in, but it has to be shot with intent. And so that's why to your question, how many shots do you take it? Some there, there has been a service where I literally have shot maybe 50 frames, but I was able to get maybe six or seven shots from that time because it really comes down to intent and knowing your camera and anticipating certain moments. And I don't, that's why I tell people to not stress out in terms of how many shots you get, because there's always next Sunday. There's always next Wednesday. There's always the next Bible devotion. You know, and if you go to every one of these events as much as I usually do, um, you do get backed up a little bit. So, for instance, I posted um, tonight, uh, I, I posted on, on Instagram, maybe, maybe about 20 minutes before our interview, um, come to service tonight, 730, right? There was a photo that I took last Wednesday. So a full week later, I'm already I'm posting a photo that I took last Wednesday. And, but it's fine because if you space everything out, it seems like you have this endless bountiful supply of photos. So people might be tempted to post all 10 at once or 15, whatever. But honestly, I would do maybe one to four and then the rest just scattered throughout. Um, it's really just me and the other photographer. We have control over images. We don't have a database because we just kind of trust each other. We, we've been doing this together for so many, for so long that we just trust each other to kind of just keep everything in the archive and on our own and be the best judgment whenever we post a photo for ourselves. I think there's only been one time out of these past three years of us having this Instagram account that my friend deleted a photo of mine because he didn't like it, you know? <laughs> and so oh my gosh. That, that's, a good, that, that's a good ratio though, you know? But for the sure. most part, it was just like everything else was fine. In closing, is there anything that you um... – any other tips or tricks or anything that um, for those that might be looking at trying to do more to, to boost up their Instagram accounts at their churches, anything that they should maybe uh, consider doing, or is there anything that you guys have found that's like just working really well? Yeah. So I, I guess it's kind of more like a brief recap really, but the main thing is just focus on good content. Not everything needs to be shared on the main page, right? whatever announcements you have to make, make them for Instagram stories. Um, and also if, and if you end up doing a flyer, right, make the flyer as minimalist as possible. Don't have all these crazy designs, right? Well, what our philosophy is, is to have a clean design of the graphic with all the information in the caption. Reason being is because plans change, times change. And if these things change, then you have to redo an entire graphic 
when all you have to do is just change the caption. So that's, that's one bit of advice that we just hold dear to, and it works great for us. Um, make sure that your Instagram page and Facebook is not flooded with tons of flyers because nobody wants to see a bulletin board. People want to see people. People want to see a, a church that's alive. And that's something you have to strive for. When you photograph people, make sure that it's emotion that you're capturing. Make sure it's a, po- a person with arms, hands raised, crying tears, whatever, um, hands on chest, whatever. If a person's just standing there, that's not a good photograph. There has to be either, either a story element. I could talk about composition for hours. <laughs> there, so the, the basic, the basic tool that I would say, you might know this obviously, is rule of thirds, right? Mm-hmm. Having your subject off center a little bit. There's one concept that I use a lot. Um, there's two concepts that I use a lot. One is the Fibonacci spiral. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's there's a starting point. I'm gonna use the, I'm gonna use the edge of my uh, my screen here. There's a starting point, and it just kind of travels all throughout the image like in a swoop. And what it does is that it, it kind of has like an endless loop, where your eye starts from here, it goes to this corner, but then it leads to this kind of thing in the frame then back over here, and then down. So your eyes are constantly circling the frame. So mm-hmm. if you never heard of the Fibonacci spiral, look up that compositional um, concept, and it'll change your, uh, your game for photography forever. Because you, you mentally think, all right, this person's hand is leading to over here, and this thing is leading to over here, and it just kind of keeps this circle. So Fibonacci spiral. Um, and then another composition technique that I like to use is um, triangles. Or another way is rule of threes, which for me personally, um, if I can do it, I want to have three items of interest in my photographs. So, because a lot of times what we're guilty of is just the person by themselves raising their hands and that's it. And it's not bad, you know, if the image is blown out, if the image is blown out in the background, that's, that's beautiful, clean. But if you can have the little girl praying at the altar and then maybe a hand that's on her with the mom holding her baby sister, right? You know, that's two subjects. And then in the background could be like the cross, you know? So like one girl can be here, the mom over here, and then another thing back there. There's a triangle effect where there's, there's three key points of interest. And I hope that doesn't sound vague, but it's something that if you, if, I, like, I, like I said, I can talk about this for hours, where <laughs> if, you, if you look at some of my photographs, most definitely you, you'll either see leading lines, right? Or you'll see the rule of threes where there's either something, there's three, usually three elements in the frame or the Fibonacci spiral. And like I said before, I shoot like this on purpose with intent because I know that, that it's something that makes people come back to seeing a photo again and again. And it's very subconscious too, where they're like, I like this photograph. I don't know. I don't really know why exactly because it's subconscious and then, it, but it's something that keeps their attention on the photograph because it's always something new to look at in the frame. Mm. So I say that to say this is that don't take snapshots, take a photograph that I'll preach this forever is shot with intent where there's a reason why you photographed it and make sure there's little details in there that make it, a full image, you know, and even if there's no um, other things to put in there, just make sure it looks pretty and clean. That's pretty much all we require, really. All that extra stuff of composition is just more my personal bias and taste and stuff like that. Um, for for iPhone photography, just it, lighting is key. That's the huge thing. Even when you're indoors, a lot of times the platform always has the best lighting. Um, but of course the problem will be if you aim at the audience sometimes, but you know, there, there's minor hacks. You can bring a light with you if you want it to, or you can just embrace the darkness and just use it to your creative advantage, which is another thing too. People are wondering, you know, like it's, this, the, the audience looks so dark and sometimes that, that's a good thing. Sometimes, you know, if you can, gr- if you can get a nice overall exposure of your scene, highlight shadows, whatever, I, I would prefer, um, a, um, a darker image of the audience if it meant that the overall image looks good you know with whatever was perfectly exposed 
Michael, thank you so much for taking your time today and doing this, jumping on this interview today, um, just talking about what it is that you are so good at. And I'm so grateful that our paths have crossed and that uh, you posted and you created content. Are you guys seeing the power of that? Like I got connected with Michael because he created content. And if you if you start doing that exact same thing for your church or for whatever it is that you're doing in your life, if you are creating content, it will connect you with other people. And guess what? If I didn't do this, you guys, if I'm not creating my own content, I wouldn't have been able to cra- to cross paths with Michael. And so the fact that I'm here today being able to talk with him, he got to share his gift and passion with us uh, is a huge blessing. And I'm, I'm very grateful to you, uh, Michael, for jumping on today. So thank you so much. And, uh, it, and I'll put everything down in the show notes down below, you guys, uh, for everything that Michael talked about and especially his link. Go check him out. Go follow him. Subscribe to him and show him some love and uh, for at least taking the time out today and having this conversation with us. So thank you so much, Michael. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Have a good one.